Hello, welcome to Light from Above. My name is David Kenny. I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ here in Wadsworth, Ohio on West Good Avenue. Glad to have you with us today. Uh, today we're going to continue our series of lessons talking about the New Testament Christian. These are based on a lectureship that I attended at the Memphis School of Preaching. I brought a picture in to show you the church building uh, where the church meets there on Forest Hill Irene Road there in Memphis. This is also where the Memphis School of Preaching operates out of. The Memphis School of Preaching is under the oversight of the elders of the congregation there that meets at Forest Hill Irene Road. And that sort of leads into what we're going to be talking about today, and it's the idea of the New Testament Christian respects the authority of elders. And just give you a, a quote from the book and a little bit of a, the book there where if you want to order it. But Joe Nichols was speaking about respects the authority of the elders. And he made this statement, said, Christians who love Jesus and his church will, without reservation, love and respect those who are ordained by God as overseers to nurture them into heaven. Philippians 3, 20 through 21. The truest friends in this life are those who are concerned for souls and where they will spend eternity. Elders who serve God faithfully are concerned for the members' souls and deserve their love and respect. And that is so true. You know, we live in a day where a lot of people don't have respect for authority of any type of authority. And, that, and some people think that, well, if we can just get rid of all these laws and all these regulations and everything, that we'll have, you know, peace and harmony. But that's just not the case. What we'll actually have is anarchy. Uh, a lack of authority produces anarchy. And the Lord gives us his um, blueprint that we need to follow in regards to the New Testament church. And that's something that we need to think of. Now, when I went to college at Free Hardeman University, I studied management. And the professor I had explained several concepts of organizations as it relates to business and other organizations and about how you know, there's certain pitfalls of different various sizes and types of organizations. For example, he would say, well, if you have a king or maybe you have one man at the top, uh, then the organization is only going to be as strong or they're going to be greatly impacted by that one man. And if that one man uh, all of a sudden is not there anymore, that the organization may suffer, they may suffer such that they may not survive that. And we know that that happens in some businesses, you know, like a proprietorship where the owner uh, is the person who runs the business. If he passes away or he moves away or whatever, the business in that location is in immediate jeopardy. Or you have, you know, other types of organizations like some that are highly decentralized, where the power is dispersed or distributed to the lower levels of the organization. And you have all these different business units, and these business units can sort of run on their own uh, autonomy, their own authority. They, do, they still report to the head, but this is really sort of far removed. And that organizational structure has its problems too. Uh, but it also has strengths as well, as the other one does. If you have a solid man at the top, then a highly centralized organization may be the most efficient way. Or if you don't, then the decentralized may be the better option. Well, when you talk about the New Testament church, you really have elements of both. Uh, some people mistakenly think that the church is not organized, and that is just totally false. And that's what we're going to talk about today, and we'll show you these three points we're going to talk about. Uh, one, the organization of the church, and then the qualifications of the leadership, and the role of an elder, and the eldership. Now, first I want to talk about you know, some false organization types that are out there that some people think they've substituted. And the first one I want to talk about is this idea of committees. Now, I had to be very careful how to describe this. There's nothing wrong with a church and an eldership having a committee or things like that. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is a church that says, you know what, we have people that are qualified to serve as elders, but we're not going to have an eldership here. We, we don't like elders. We don't like that position. We don't like reporting to that kind of authoritative structure. We don't like that. So what we decided to do is we're going we're gonna to break the power up and we're going to give it to committees. And we're going to give the committee the authority to be able to do A, B, C, or D. And so they reject the biblical pattern and they'll, com they'll put whoever they want in charge of those committees, whether or not they're qualified to be in those positions or not. And that's a, that's a real dangerous kind of situation. I, I ran into that one time 
uh, myself, where the, the people just, you know, they, I asked them, I said, why don't you have elders? You, you have, I mean, obviously I'm not from the congregation, so I'm visiting, but you have a lot of people here. It's a pretty good sized congregation. And maybe they didn't have anybody qualified, but that's not what they said when I asked them. What they said was, we prefer to have committees instead of an eldership. Well, you're not following the New Testament pattern. You're not following the scriptures then. I mean, that's different than saying, okay, we're going to have a committee within the structure of an eldership or the, you know, that, that's a different kind of attitude. So we got to be careful about that. We're trying to follow the New Testament. If we're going to be a New Testament Christian, a part of the New Testament church, that means we follow the New Testament. Or another one, another false organization uh, relates to a board of directors. Now, this is a little tricky as well because, uh, because of the government and the things that you know, churches are expected to do uh, to maintain IRS compliance and things of that nature. Um, they may say, well, you know, if you're going to incorporate what you have to do and it's W-2s and all that kind of stuff, you have to have a board of directors. And you have to appoint men or women, they don't, the IRS doesn't care, uh, who you have as board of directors. Well, you know, if you have an eldership, and you have them all be on your board of directors, and so you, really the eldership is the board of directors, that's not so, you know, that's, there's no problem with that. But not every organization, not every congregation is able to do that. Uh, a church has to be incorporated. Maybe they don't have an eldership. Well, what do they do then? Well, they may appoint men as board of directors in order to meet the, co the compliance that the government has them to do, but they cannot, they cannot take on the leadership independent of what God has ordained as the leadership for the church. Saw so a really nice congregation, you know, both these congregations I mentioned are very nice people, and it's not that kind of criticism, but what we're pointing out is, you know, we're trying to follow the New Testament. Well, this congregation, what they did is, you know, they started out with a board of directors, I think is what happened, and they, they worked through the board of directors. Well, then they realized, oh, wait a minute, uh, you know, we, we need to establish an eldership. Well, the challenge was some of the people that were on the board couldn't be in the eldership. So what did they do? Well, they decided, okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to appoint an eldership, and then we're going to have an eldership and a board of directors. And this eldership and the board of directors, they both are leading the church. They're co-equal. And, and so and I asked them when I was talking about that, I said, whatever happens if the eldership doesn't agree with the board of directors. How do you resolve that? They didn't have a very good answer for that. I mean, they just didn't, they said, well, we would think that they would follow the eldership. And I'm like, you think they would, but what if they didn't? You see, a board of directors, you have to be careful about that kind of a situation. You don't let something like that get out of hand. Now, this isn't a criticism of congregations. They've had to, in order to fulfill an IRS requirement or some kind of government requirement to incorporate that they have to name officers of that corporation. That's just standard corporation procedure. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is when the people that are appointed to fulfill the obligation of the IRS, they take on a leadership role that they're not qualified for and they're not authorized to do in the sight of God. And there's a big distinction there that hopefully your understanding. Well, what does the organizational structure of the church in the New Testament look like? Well, I'll give you this one. Uh, this is the best I can do. This, I mean, other people can draw a better one, and, and there's probably, you know, people say, well, I don't like this about this, or I don't like that, but um, really you have, you know, Jesus Christ is the, is the top, and then you have elders, and then there's elders, if you notice, uh, one group of elders is over one congregation, and then, you know, another group of elders is other, another congregation, and they're autonomous from one another. The elders are autonomous from each other, and the congregations are autonomous from one another. But the congregations work with the elders who rep all report uh, through to Jesus Christ. Now, let's take an idea, you know, take a, this idea of Jesus being the head of the church. L let's take a look at, you know, a couple passages here I want you to look at. One is Colossians 1.24. It says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of, of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Okay, so his church is a body. That's pretty plain there. 
but look at the other one. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So now notice he's the head of the church. He's the head, and look at Colossians, he's the head of the body. To say that Christ is the head of the church is the same thing to say as Christ is the head of the body. Now you might think, okay, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, how many bodies are there? Well, there's one. Well, how many heads does that body have? One. Christ is the head of the church. Whether he is in heaven or whether he would be on the earth, he's not on the earth anymore, regardless of what his location would be, he is always the head of the church. It's not a situation, you know, where you have a head of the church in heaven and a head of the church on the earth. I mean, that's like having a body that has two heads. Now, in any other kind of context, if you had a being that had two heads, what would you think of that? You know, but we have groups out there that, you know, they substitute someone else or something else as the head of the church. And they don't really pay attention to Jesus Christ. As, you know, maybe they say they do, but do they really? Do they really pay attention to his word? That's something you have to investigate the scriptures for yourself to see and be aware of that. But also, another, you know, I don't go by the term pastor. I don't serve as an elder. Now, some people mistakenly, they call me a pastor. And, and some people, you know, they just don't understand New Testament vocabulary, New Testament terms. And I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings. They don't hurt my feelings when they say that. I try to be, you know, very charitable to them. And, and you know, but if I have opportunity to explain to them, I'm not a pastor. But, you know, take a look at this passage in the book of Acts. This is Acts chapter 20. And I grabbed some verses, 17, 18, 27, and 28. And I want you to notice something that's very important here. Pastors and elders and bishops, those are all names for the same group of people. Now, you'll have groups out there, they'll say, well, you know, we have, a, we have a pastor, and then we have, you know, we have an eldership, and then maybe we have bishops, and then, you know, and they have this, you know, and they're all different people. But that's not the way it is in the New Testament. And what I did was I, I copied these passages down, and then I went to the Greek, and I, you know, put the words in there so you know what they are, and what words they're referring to. And it says, for Miletus he sent, he is Paul, sent to Ephesus and called for the elders, presbyterus, presbytery, the eldership of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Episcopos, that's a term we get bishop from. To shepherd, pomea, to feed. The eldership is a pastor. That's the term for pastor, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, if you look at those passages and those words and the context what's going on, you're going to see that the same group of men, incidentally, they were the eldership of a church in a location, which was Ephesus. This is Paul speaking to the elders in Ephesus. One congregation, one eldership. He uses those three terms to refer to the same group of men. So people that go and they say, well, you know what, we have, we have a pastor, and then, you know, we're going to have, you know, we have this other group of people, we're going to call them bishops, and then we have this other group of people we're going to call elders, or, or, or different variations of that. You know, there's so many combinations out there that man has made up on their own that it's hard to keep up with all of them. But you need to pay attention to the fact that all of these terms refer to the same group of people. One writer, um, Wayne Jackson, made this not notice about it. It says, when other passages are considered, we learn that pastors, bishops, and elders must meet scriptural qualifications. 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1. We'll look at those in a minute. And they serve in a plurality over a single congregation. Titus 1, 5, Acts 14, 23, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 2. B.F. Westcott observed, from a consideration of these passages, it is evident that there was not as yet a recognized ecclesiastical hierarchy. In other words, you know, when you, when you look at church history and you go back to the first century, you had elders over a congregation in a location. 
if there was multiple congregations, then you'd have multiple elderships. And they all you know, looked to Jesus Christ and his word for their governance. And that's what they did. Well, time went by and people got away from paying attention to that. And, and they took slow, gradual steps. And one of the steps that they did, they said, well, you know what? We have these, we have these congregations, maybe say in a county. It wasn't a county, but just for the sake of ease of discussion here. And one of these, one of these churches is stronger than the other, the other three. And they say, well, we have a solid eldership here. Why don't we have these other elderships, or excuse me, these, these other congregations, why don't we have this eldership do the leadership for those other congregations too because they're small and they don't have qualified men to serve as elders. And so people say, well, oh, okay. Well, eventually what happened is you would have that go on and then you would, you would just, you, you would have, well, you know, we have these different elders over top of these different congregations, but who's, who's really going to make sure they're all in line? So then they point someone like maybe a cardinal or, or some other term. And then, you know, you get a group of them, you might call them a synod. And as time goes by, you know, they just keep adding and adding and adding until you have what you see in a lot of our religious groups today. And it's not what was in the first century. It's not according to the New Testament. So these things are very important that we understand. Well, let's look at the qualifications for a person to serve as an elder. In 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7 is one group of the qualifications that I would, I would have you take a look at and read. But I'd like to make a couple points from this passage to make sure that you take note of. One, there's no mention of an Aaronic or a Melchizedek priesthood here. We have religious groups that say, well, you know, we have one set of qualifications for an elder to serve in the Aaronic priesthood and another set of qualifications for a man to serve as in the um, priesthood or the eldership of the Melchizedek priesthood. There is no such thing here. That is not taught in the New Testament. They, you have to have another testament to have something like that. And so it's important to note that. And also, you know, the idea of an elder has the idea of someone who's older, more mature, not, you know, not some kid or not some teenager or, or a young person. This person has to be someone of maturity. The term uh, presbyterus has the idea of older, uh, wiser. And so you need to take note of that as well. He must be proven not only to be an effective husband, but also an effective father too. And Paul tells him why that is important. You know, he's supposed to be the husband of one wife. Supposed to be. Has to be. You know, we have people running around claiming to be elders. They're not married. They're not qualified to be elders. And they have to have children. And the children has to be such that you can look at them and say, this, this person's not only a good husband, he's also a good father. And so we can tell that he's able to rule, guide his own house. Then if he can guide his own house in this respect, we ought to see that he ought to be able to guide God's house. And so that's important that we take note of as well. And notice it says, moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside. Well, you know, too many people, when they're thinking about having elders put in place, they'll say, well, I didn't hear anything bad. Nothing bad has ever come across my desk or nobody's calling me and telling me uh, this person is not suitable for this kind, type of responsibility. But you know what? <laughs> you need to go and do your homework. Do your due diligence. I mean, that's a big business term. Due diligence means go out and investigate. Find out. You know, the good testimony, you're supposed to go and ask people, do you know this person? Is he an honest business person? Is he a good father? Um, you know, talk to the police if you have to. You know, have you ever had a domestic violence type of things? You know, you get the idea. You know, just because, you know, some people say, well, no news is good news. Well, they need to rethink that. No news is just no news. They need to go out and investigate it. They need to go out and find out. Well, here's the other list. This is Titus chapter 1, uh, 5 through 9 for you to take a look here. And notice here a couple things I'll just mention about this list. One is blameless. You know, we have some people that think that, you know, if they're a preacher, they can go in and they can uproot an eldership and they can appoint whoever they want and they can do whatever they want. Um, and they don't have to give any account to maybe existing elders or maybe even the congregation themselves. And they'll say, I could do this myself. But, you know, Titus is visiting these places. He has some knowledge of them, but he doesn't have a lot of knowledge of them. And notice that the person has to be blameless. Well, how is he going to know that? Well, he doesn't know that unless other people tell him that. He, this person is like the good report. 
this person has to be blameless. And also notice that this person's a steward of God. A steward is a manager. They report to God. An elder just can't go and do whatever an elder wants to do without regards to what God has given them the authority to do. And then notice the last one here is really important. Holding fast the faithful words as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. He has to be very knowledgeable of the scriptures. Sadly, too many people rely on the preacher to be the only one with the knowledge. That's a very dangerous situation. Men that are appointed to this need to be thoroughly well-equipped to know the scriptures so they know false doctrine when they hear it. Sadly, too many uh, do not do that. But, you know, when we talk about, you know, elders and respect for them, you know, some people have misconceptions of what an elder is. And, I, and I'll give you a list here, and we'll talk about a few of them. Uh, we already talked about the board of directors. Uh, the idea, this idea has the idea that they're just business managers. That's all they do. All they do is financial matters. They, they don't really have any other kind of authority outside of that. They're like a board of directors. Well, you know, the, the elders are more than that. Uh, they're not even board of directors anyway, but... There's, that's a false concept. Or a political figure. Some people think that a person can serve as an elder as long as they, they remain popular with people. Well, they're supposed to be judged by their faithfulness to the scriptures. It's not a popularity contest. Uh, some think that uh, an elder serves by example only. Well, example they definitely serve by. We're all supposed to be good examples, but they have real authority too. It's not just by example. And then sometimes a you know, person may think, well, I'm a lord or I'm a dictator. But that's not a valid concept either. The New Testament warns about that. Or we mentioned the idea of a ruling elder, one elder that is above another elder, or maybe an elder that's above uh, multiple congregations. That's something that you have to, to look at. But when you talk about the work of an elder, there's a lot of things that go into it. And I can only just mention a few of what the work of an elder is. And we'll just touch on these briefly. One is to shepherd the flock. You have to be among them. You have to know your sheep. There's a very popular book out there. Um, you know, they, the elders smell like sheep. They smell them. They're, they're with them. They know them. You, you know, they can't be detached. They have to be apart. They have to protect the flock from wolves. Well, you know, when we talk about wolves, well, that's another figure of speech for false teachers. If they're going to protect a flock from false teachers, they need to know the truth versus error. And that's their responsibility to do that. They're supposed to take the oversight of the work of the church, financially, operationally, developmentally, in all aspects, they're supposed to take the oversight of it. And that includes feeding the flock. You know, they may not be dispersing the food, but they're responsible for the diet. That means whether you know, they're responsible for what's being taught, whether it's from the pulpit or from the classroom. And they have a responsibility to follow up to make sure that those things are being taught properly. They are also supposed to protect the flock from fads and trends and things that, you know, that come along that will threaten the very survival of the church. And there's things that have come along, and some of them have not, you know, we have changes. And, you know, we went from, for example, transparencies to PowerPoint, uh, things like that. We're not talking about that. But there are some things that come along that some people, you know, we shouldn't have gotten involved in. Uh, for example, some people will write books telling you how you don't follow the New Testament, and then they'll write more books to tell you how you follow what they're telling you. you know, and elders kind of be on the lookout for that kind of thing. They follow the New Testament as we follow the New Testament. Well, what about the reward? Why would a person even want this kind of responsibility? You know, people talk about counseling, and sometimes they look to the preacher to be their counselor. And, you know, a preacher, you know, they might be in a position to do something like that. But they really should be looking for the spiritual guidance from the eldership. They should really be looking there. Now, the elders may delegate. Uh, maybe they have an expert in their congregation that deals with the problems this person's facing. But again, you know, we ought to be looking to the eldership for that kind of direction. That's important. Well, why would anybody want to do it? Yeah, that's a, that's a real good question. And I have no better answer than what the Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 through 4. He says, The elders who are among you I exhort. I am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And pause there. He's a fellow elder. He doesn't call himself a pope. Uh, go on. And also a partaker of the glory which, that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for honest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords for those entrusted to you, 
but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, referring to Jesus, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Elders have a great responsibility, and they have a great work. And biblically qualified, properly serving elders, a New Testament Christian should want that, respecting that of a New Testament Christian, but New Testament qualified elders would never be a problem. Thanks for watching our program today. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map, don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the roadmap to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.